Welcome back, everyone. And we're ready for our next speaker, who is Patrick Mohini, who has been married for 42 years and has two children and two grandchildren. Patrick holds a bachelor's degree in botany and a master's degree in plant pathology from Auburn. His certifications include ISA certified arborist, Georgia Green Industry plant professional, Georgia Lifetime Master Gardener, and a first degree black belt in American style karate. So we have two martial arts speakers today. Patrick owns Prestige Shrub and Trees in Duluth, Georgia, and his company has been in operation in Metro Atlanta since 1985. Prestige provides chemical tree and shrub and lawn care to residential and commercial customers. He also designs and directs seminars on workplace safety, pesticide <coughs> safety, integrated plant health management, pest problems and solutions, and professionalism in business. When Patrick is not working, he's fishing or planning to go fishing. Welcome, Patrick. The floor is yours. Thank you, Bodie. Um, well, we had quite a uh, morning this morning. We woke up to about an inch and a half, or well, about an inch of snow uh, in Duluth, Georgia, which I think we've now in Atlanta, we're at about 130% our normal snow load. So uh, it was a little trick trying to get in this morning. But um, uh, hopefully everybody made it in on time and is uh, enjoying the seminar. Rick did a great job. And uh, so we're going to talk about boxwood blight identification and management strategies. And I will tell you this up front, uh, it's not, uh, I'm not going to paint a, a pretty picture. So um, it would be nice if uh, boxwood blight, if you could identify it uh, by this picture, if it just looked like this. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't, of course. And, uh, and Rick did tell me that this wasn't one of his... Uh, um, pruning jobs, but uh, it's quite interesting. So uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, dive into this uh, into the seminar. Um, boxwood blight is caused by the fungus Calinetrica pseudonaviculatum. It just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Uh, and um, it's got some also synonyms: uh, cylindrocladium uh, uh, pseudonaviculatum and cylindrocladium buxicola. It that doesn't really uh, matter. Uh, here nor there. So uh, it's first detected in the United Kingdom in 1994. Some say it actually was there earlier. It probably was. It's found in New Zealand in 2002. And it was first detected in the U.S. in 2011 in North Carolina Con and Connecticut. Uh, now it's in multiple states and also in Canada. At first, we thought the boxwood blight, for the most part, followed the pattern of infection found elsewhere. Uh, when it infected elsewhere, it would attack the plants, and literally within days, the planting would be completely dead. Um, we felt here that uh, it would only actively infect during times of cool weather and extended wet periods. And well, as Scooby would say, rut row. And uh, I, I will tell you guys this, I'm usually in front of an audience doing this, so if I happen to say something very witty, I would assume that y'all are going to laugh out there, and I'll just take it for granted. So there we go. Uh, the host includes Sarcococca. Uh, if you don't know the plant, there's some homework to be done uh, for you folks out there. So Sarcococca is one of the hosts. Uh, Pachysandra, you notice I have that in red because Pachysandra is used a lot of times in these plantings with boxwoods. Um, and then the Buxa species and all the various varieties. Uh, temperatures between 50 and 80 degrees seem to be optimal for infection. And again, I'm talking about Atlanta. Um, it acts a little differently elsewhere. Uh, but we'll get into that in a minute. The spores germinate and they penetrate the leaves within five hours. No wound is necessary, but open wounds such as from pruning do increase the infection and the spread. High humidity or leaf wetness is required for infection. Uh, leaves fall off the plant once it's infected, and that's uh, one of the indicators that you do have boxwood blight versus another problem. So the disease can be spread by splashing of spores uh, called conidia through irrigation or rainfall. The spores can be wind disseminated and due to the sticky nature of the conidia, it can be carried by animals, people, clothes, implements, shoes, hands, uh, plant debris, uh, debris, infected plants, animals, birds, cats, dogs, coyotes, turkeys, deer, uh, whatever you have in your area, they all can carry this uh, fungus in the spores and spread it. Uh, the, here's one of the major problems. This fungus produces microsclerotia, 
which can survive in the soil and in debris for possibly 10 plus years. So for all practical purposes, if this disease moves in and infects your boxwood planting, you pretty much have boxwood blight for pretty much forever in most plantings, is for the way we handle these plantings. All right, <clears throat> first let's talk about what it is not. Uh, it is not winter injury or winter bronzing. Uh, you can see um, here, this is a um, uh, winter injury on a Korean type boxwood, um, very, very tightly pruned hedge. And you can see that the, uh, the top of this plant was burned because the here in Atlanta, the Korean boxwoods uh, bolt very early. If we get any warm weather in January, February, they'll begin to grow. And of course, any frost uh, will cause a burn back. Uh, this actually was an early, early pruning, and then we had a late frost and it burned it. Pruning damage on the Korean style boxwoods, boxwoods is very similar. Uh, here, um, this is the typical bronzing we get in Atlanta. We get a lot of this. This is due to myriad of problems. You may hear that it's due to sun scalding, uh, wind damage. What we find is mostly it uh, has to do with the plant, just not a happy plant. It's not planted correctly. Uh, it is possibly too dry, uh, possibly too wet. And then uh, you add the winter to that, and this is what you get is this bronzing. Most of these plants grow out of this as the season goes on. Sometimes, though, it'll take you sometimes into June, even before this plant responds, it starts growing again. <clears throat> and it's not dog damage. Uh, this is uh, not super common, but we see this um, across the board. Uh, the customer, of course, usually uh, says, well, I don't have a dog. Well, we didn't blame it on her dog or her not dog, uh, but there's dogs roaming the neighborhood. And of course, the customer never sees this. Uh, this we know for sure was dog damage because we caught the culprit in the act, and you see it does a nice job. Uh, unfortunately, you'll notice this, the, the leaves are gone on this plant uh, for the most part here, but you notice up here, the leaves remain, and that makes it suspect that it's not boxwood blight. So again, you've got to put your detective hat on and do some detective work to um, look closely at what's causing some of these problems. This is um, volutella blight. Uh, this is not boxwood blight. You may see a lot of this um, in your plantings. This, interestingly enough, uh, this is on a Korean type boxwood. And um, this usually comes from, uh, which I a photo I'll show you in a minute, uh, the crowns can become quite clogged with debris. You get aerial root formation, which weakens the plant, causes some problems in the crown. Uh, then this plant can be, become very susceptible to volutella blight. Uh, usually it's a location situation. This is treatable, uh, though it should never have gotten to this point um, on this plant because now the point the plant is severely damaged and it's very hard to bring boxwoods back from this type of damage. And you'll notice here the leaves are staying on the plant. That's a um, a key. And as I mentioned, this is uh, this is pruning damage. Uh, again, on a Korean boxwood, uh, they came in here. There was a lot of young growth on this, uh, and this was pruned uh, in. Um, June during a hot spell, they did the pruning, and we end up with a prune, uh, a burn on the top of the plant. The plant recovers pretty well from this, um, but it does take a while. Uh, most of these, our customers, we try to educate the customers as to what we're looking for for the boxwood blight, uh, and also landscapers, um, installers. Uh, the problem is everybody that works with boxwoods, anything they see, they assume it's boxwood blight. Okay. It's not a leaf miner. Uh, this is one reason I really dislike boxwoods. These, these guys get a lot of different problems. And uh, the leaf miner, obviously, you can see here that it does cause this browning of the leaves. This is very severe leaf miner infestation to the point where the leaves are starting to uh, brown up. They're starting to fall off. And again, if you examine the plant closely, this is what you're going to see here, the back of the leaves. You'll see the blister with the leaf miner uh, inside that little blister right there. So again, detective hat, look closely. Don't jump to conclusions as to what's going on with these boxwoods. All righty. So the introduction of this disease, it's, it really came in um, uh, in Atlanta. Uh, I'm going to get you, get you into the uh, ground zero here in a second here. Uh, but... Um, this, for instance, came, this is boxwood blight here. 
and you can see the leaves have fallen off the plant and boxwood blight here. This, these are old, old, about, uh, they estimated 60 to 70 year old boxwoods, American boxwoods. Uh, we don't know where it came from, but uh, the pruning spread both of these, um, uh, spread the infection of both of these different, these are two different sites and uh, the subsequent pruning after this boxwood was infected. And again, we don't know where, where the boxwood, um, where the infection came from. It could have been any, any type of input. Okay, uh, it's not um, cultural poor maintenance issues such as debris, the crowns, poor drainage, lack of water. Here's, here's the aerial roots I was speaking about. If you let these boxwoods build up with debris in the crown, they will produce these aerial roots right here. The aerial roots, the problem with this is, is that they do not function correctly because they're basically air roots. They're trying to function because uh, they need uh, the soil uh, around them. And when they're in the air, they begin to uh, harden off. They superize, they get very woody. And the stem in this area becomes very woody. So the plumbing starts getting messed up. And so your transfer of uh, water, nutrients, uh, the back and forth transfer is um, interrupted. So the top of the plant then starts looking like this plant over here you get this what looks like the bronzing but this will happen any time of the year if you see this then you need to check for aerial roots you need to check for debris you need to check for poor drainage or lack of water all these things affect the plants now again i keep talking about putting your detective hat on um, this is something you've got to do to uh, really investigate get down inside that plant and see what's going on um nematodes nobody ever talks about nematodes um this is a little um, microscopic uh, plant parasitic worm. And most of our boxwoods in Atlanta, they actually have nematodes in the soil that are munching and poking at the roots. Uh, and they, they cause a slow decline. Um, unfortunately, there's no treatment um, for label treatment for uh, uh, nematodes in our soils. Uh, we've lost most of the labels years ago for any uh, nematicides. There's some new chemicals on the uh, horizon that may be used. This is kind of akin to if you're climbing up a ladder and somebody's tugging on your pants leg the whole time and won't let you get up that ladder. This is what the nematodes and many of these other problems for the boxwoods do to the boxwoods. They just won't thrive and they constantly are having issues with uh, yellowing off color. Uh, this planting at first, we thought it was probably a uh, water issue. And then once we checked everything, dotted our I's, crossed our T's, we realized nothing is really wrong until we took that soil sample. Uh, and actually ran it for nematodes and found out that it was they were highly infected with nematodes. So that's the problem there. Um, this is an example of uh, infection and spread of the American boxwood. I think my slides are slightly out of uh, sync here. I'm sorry for that, but we'll get into it uh, hopefully still. Um, here's one of the problems with this disease. Uh, it was said that um, the boxwood blight uh, won't infect, or at least the uh, the Korean boxwoods, uh, the American boxwoods, all these different boxwoods have different resistant levels. And um, here's one of the problems. Uh, this is an American boxwood here. Uh, this plant was brought in. It's a dwarf English boxwood. It was brought into this planting. Uh, there were no visible signs of the disease. And you can see that's the boxwood blight working this, uh, this dwarf English boxwood after it uh, developed. And you'll notice that uh, it is actually, it's hard to see here, but right in here, it has actually jumped over to the American boxwood. Um, another thing that's not scale, and I apologize again, I'm kind of jumping around the slides here, but we'll get back into the meat of this in a second. Uh, it's not scale. You see scale on these boxwoods once in a blue moon. Uh, and the outside appearance of the boxwood does look like it's starting to fail. Uh, again, look at the inside of the plant. It's really obvious that this is um, that the scale is the problem here. Okay. And then you're sensing a theme here. Uh, if, if you plant a boxwood correctly, maintain it correctly, you should be able to produce a uh, very beautiful plant. That's long lived in the landscape. The problem comes with, in that most boxwoods are not planted correctly. And from that point on, they are problematic. Um, they uh, either are planted too high, too low, the wrong soil mix, uh, poorly drained soil, not watered, 
uh, and suddenly these boxwoods decline and they take so long to recover that uh, you just have a plant that becomes not serviceable in the long run. Uh, so uh, you can tell again, I, I'm not, boxwoods are not my favorite plant in the landscape. Um, so in Atlanta, our weather allows the boxwood blight to infect in the spring and the fall with extended periods of cool wet weather during hurricanes like Irma, we had infection. Uh, and Irma for us really was not a particularly extended wet period, but we did get infections after Irma. Uh, by the action of overflowing creeks, we found it. Uh, anytime after a pruning event and at any time an animal happens by, you could possibly have an infection. Uh, our boxwood blight infects in full sunlight, heavy shade, light shade, high shade, low shade. It does not seem to matter. This is slightly different um, than if you read about boxwood blight and how it um, acts. Um, if you go online and look up uh, boxwood blight, look at all the different research on it. Uh, this is a little different than um, most of that research that we've seen. It's just an oddity in Atlanta, but Atlanta always seems to have uh, nothing pays attention to what it's supposed to do in Atlanta. And we definitely get some weirdness going on. Um, due to the nature of the disease and its ability to easily spread by numerous means, it produces the microsclerotia, which can remain in the soil for years. I feel, this is my personal uh, opinion, I feel the disease may actually be endemic and entrenched in Atlanta gardens now, mainly in our downtown areas and it is able to infect for any multiple reasons and conditions. And so hopefully I'm wrong about this, but this so far what we've seen uh, since 2014, this does seem to be the case. Okay, this is where we should be. So it was first found in this landscaping. This is ground zero. It was first found in an Atlanta garden, 2014. Uh, you can see here that this is the blight here working on these. These are dwarf English boxwoods all these smaller ones. Uh, the anchor plants are the American boxwood. And uh, this planting uh, was one of our estate properties that um, we have done work on for quite a few years, uh, providing insect disease sprays for the entire property. We first noticed this, one of my technicians realized that we weren't getting response when we saw this uh, blight on the boxwoods. We assumed it was volutella blight, um, but it was acting differently, dropping leaves and we weren't getting any response from the fungicides. Uh, at that point, I actually came into the planning, dug one of these up, talked to the customer, told them I thought we might have, might have boxwood blight, dug one of these up and um, sent it over to um, UGA, Dr. Woodward over there at the UGA Pathology Lab. Uh, they ran the test and sure enough, we definitely had boxwood blight, uh, which is kind of on the level of Armageddon if you, it, it, boxwood blight is, um, found in the garden. So you can see here uh, that it's nibbling on these boxwoods. Uh, it's all these brown areas you see here, 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 et cetera, all the way through here. And you notice a little bit of a pattern. You see most of it's around where this flower planting was. We don't know how it was introduced in this garden. Uh, the flower installer possibly spread it, uh, can't point fingers at that they brought it in, but again, Whatever brought this into the planting um, caused it to spread pretty rapidly. Uh, this was, um, you can see the date down here, 7-1-2014. Uh, we actually found this back in May. Uh, and you notice it wasn't doing a lot of aggressive spreading. That's another oddity here in Atlanta. Normally, in some of these other plantings, North Carolina, up through the uh, East Coast, Delaware, Connecticut, and in Europe, if you had this type of infection, it would quickly kill the entire plant uh, that was infected. It would infect the Americans. Everything would just um, crash and die. And again, here, we don't see this. We see it kind of um, turning on and off with the weather, ebbing and flowing and kind of nibbling on stuff. Uh, but again, once it's in there, it just seems to get worse and worse. I will make one comment about this. This planting, uh, it fooled us initially because um, at, at first we saw it, we felt like the planting was gonna completely collapse within weeks. And uh, then checking it all the way into August, it actually looked like it was starting to try to regrow, which was another oddity. It shouldn't have done that, but again, it wasn't paying attention to the research and the, uh, the books about what it should do. And so what we found is 
it looked like it was going to regrow slightly. And then suddenly we had a weather event in September for us, about seven days of rainy, cool, probably Oregon or Washington weather. And it, uh, it the infection increased in severity and aggressiveness, and it began to um, kill plants completely. So here it is up close. Obviously, uh, this is not satisfactory for a planting. Again, you'll notice that uh, where you see these stems, the leaves have fallen off. Uh, the reason for that is the lesions that this fungus produces you actually girdle these stems, uh, completely killing the stem. Therefore, the, the leaves do fall off. Where in like, for instance, Volutella, you have a leaf spot or a stem lesion that does not girdle the stem. So the leaves will stay on there. But this is one of the indicators that you've got boxwood blight is that you do have leaf drop. And you'll notice, again, like I said, it's just not satisfactory. It, there's, and this doesn't recover from this, folks. Once it starts in here, uh, that's what you get, and it just keeps getting worse. Hopefully, I'm not going too fast here that we can uh, keep up with this. All righty. Um, identification. Uh, leaf spots. Um, yes, it, it will produce leaf spots. Uh, this is boxwood blight. Volutella, though, also produces a leaf spot. And you can't have leaf spots from some other diseases. The, your best bet, if you start seeing this, is to send samples into your extension service, into the pathology lab. If you're in Georgia, you'd send it to the UGA pathology lab through your extension service. Uh, go to your county agent, tell them you think you have a boxwood blight problem. They'll send the sample in. The pathology lab will look at it, run it, and and confirm or um, or uh, tell you that it's not box of blight, and then also give you recommendations for treatment, which we're gonna get into in just a minute. But you, again, you can see that you've got these nice, pretty lesions. This is a pretty severe infestation here. So the, um, I said lesions, I correct myself, the leaf spot. And um, you can see here, that's one of the lesions it makes on the stems, very characteristic of this disease in Atlanta, at least. And there's the lesions on the stems. You can see multiple lesions being produced. Uh, we have, uh, in all of our cases, we've always, when we've had a confirmed infection, we've had the um, uh, leaf spot um, and also uh, the uh, lesions, mainly the lesions. Occasionally, the leaf spot uh, is not that noticeable. Uh, but if, if you see the leaves falling off, if you start taking a look at the limbs, that's what you'll see, these black lesions on the stem very characteristic of the plant. You can see down here, right there, you can see a very big lesion, and you'll notice these are starting to go around the stem, and that's why you get the leaf drop. They start girdling the stem and um, uh, switching it off. Okay, again, here's some leaf spot, general um, view of it. Uh, this is characteristic where you see the scattered leaf spot. You can see how small they can kind of start there, um, and again, sometimes it's very hard to see them. Uh, but then uh, the easy ones to see, obviously, are these bigger leaf spots. You can see the leaves are starting to uh, uh, brown up. And you'll notice the leaf spots are on here, but there's no leaf drop yet. Uh, leaf drop comes later. Once the infection uh, continues to uh, infect and spread, and there again, there as you see, there you have the lesions on the stems. Something interesting, and I'm going to go over this a little bit later, uh, you'll notice that this has severe lesions uh, lesioning on the stems, but you see the leaves are still intact, uh, and the leaves look actually look pretty good, which is um, uh, a concern. Okay, I mentioned that Paxandra <clears throat> can be a host for boxwood blight, and can, can consequently they can infect the boxwoods uh, that are planted nearby. Um, they also, the Paxandra is a um, host for Volutella, which you can see here. You can see this water-soaked lesion. You can see it looks like water-soaked rings. That's a characteristic of Volutella blight. Um, we actually have never found the boxwood blight on um, Paxandra that we could isolate and um, uh, get confirmed. Uh, we sus had suspicions that it was uh, in some of these uh, Pack sander plantings, but we've actually never been able to uh, pull it out. The uh, here's the obviously American boxwoods here, and here's the pack of sandra obviously here. This planting uh, at this time, if you look at 2014 7 1 again, um, 
so uh, this picture was taken at a different planting other than the ground zero planting another big boxwood planting we found no boxwood blight whatsoever uh, subsequently, uh, it was um, in 2016, this planting was entirely inundated by boxwood blight. Again, we don't know what the source was. Uh, we suspect we suspect a lot of these infestations are actually coming from pets, cats, dogs, etc. All righty. Um, here's one of the problems. Uh, you'll hear that that if you plant a less susceptible variety, you're not going to have a problem. Uh, the, so a lot of the research out there and a lot of the recommendations indicate that if you have boxwood blight, blight on the property, you remove the plant uh, completely, you clean up all the debris, et cetera. And then you, uh, if you plant a less susceptible variety, like one of the Korean or Japanese types, um, because they're less susceptible, even though they may have the disease, uh, it, it's been said they are asymptomatic. They don't show any problems with it. Uh, therefore, they can become the typhoid Mary. Um, if, if you're older like me, you'll know who typhoid Mary is. Uh, though I wasn't uh, born when she was um, uh, operational, but typhoid Mary basically was a uh, was a person who had uh, had a disease uh, and was asymptomatic, not showing any symptoms. And then by moving around society, moving around town, uh, she, she basically spread this disease uh, rapidly to the rest of the population. So a infected Korean boxwood, even though it doesn't show any symptoms, if you move that into a planting, it very well could be infected and therefore it'll infect the other plants. So here's an, in, an example of this infection. This is what makes this thing so scary. Uh, initially, we suggested to folks that they could use the um, less susceptible Korean types in a planting. This planting um, had an infection from um, the original smaller plants here were dwarf English. Uh, they were infected with boxwood blight. Uh, we suggested they yank all of these plants out. At the time uh, when the dwarf English were in here, these big Americans on the corners uh, were not infected. Uh, this customer decided they wanted to try the less susceptible um, Korean style boxwood. I'm pretty sure this is like a little gem, uh, but it's one of the Korean or Japanese styles. Uh, these were brought in. They were asymptomatic. They look clean. The um, Within about a month, uh, they had a pruning event. They pruned these and pruned the American boxwoods. And you can see um, the, the disease at first we thought moved from these boxwoods into the Americans. We're not sure now uh, because this planting already had a previous infection. But you'll notice that as they were pruned, they spread this disease through the entire planting. This planting, um, we also noticed these uh, in an isolated area where there were not any previous dwarf English boxwoods. Uh, they had put in some new Koreans, and those Koreans are also infected. That's why we think it actually came in on these Korean boxwoods, and then it jumped into the American. So again, with this less susceptible Korean boxwood here uh, turned into a Trojan horse and uh, it finished this whole planet. You can see how severe when he gets cranked up, you can see what this disease does to the boxwoods. And again, no recovery from this. They do not come back from this. They just get worse till they're dead. Okay, here's an example of um, going the other way. This property we had identified boxwood blight on an American boxwood. The customer promptly removed them, cleaned up the area. They were only on two boxwoods. We suggested he not bring any more boxwoods in. The rest of the property had these um, smaller Korean style, style boxwoods. Uh, I think these are um, Green Valleys. Uh, to be honest with you, there's so many different varieties. We classify them as American Dwarf English or Korean. Um, so this customer brought in this nice, pretty, formally pretty American boxwood. Uh, within weeks, we had the right weather set up. We had excessive uh, rainfall, light rains, cool weather. Uh, the American suddenly showed up with the uh, uh, the disease and it jumped, you say proximity wise, it jumped into this Korean boxwood. Now, interesting enough on the Koreans, they if they get infected from what we've seen, if you prune this, believe it or not, and clean it up, it doesn't seem to spread elsewhere as long as you don't prune from here to there.
But again, that end of the plant's dead, does not come back. Uh, and again, the main problem is you've got boxwood blight on this property and this property is really should be shut down to any more boxwood plantings. Uh, so subsequently this plant's been removed. He's kept a lot of these Koreans in. Uh, and it's interesting enough, he replaced these end ones with new Korean boxwoods. We have not seen any disease spread at this point, but the big Americans definitely brought it in and then it jumped to the um, this boxwood, which is one of the uh, more um, resistant boxwoods. So it has to do with proximity. This was not even a pruning event. This was just a proximity event, splashing spores. This was one that we really um, opened our eyes to, um, to this disease and what it can do. Uh, this infection developed after an adjacent creek overflowed. Um, and um, the customer called and said, I think I've got boxwood blight. I said, we'll check it out. And sure enough, uh, she said, it's on the back of the plants, which I thought was interesting. Uh, it is not on the front of the plants. So I'll show you a picture later of that. So the back of this plant's infected. Uh, you can see the water basically came up underneath these plants about halfway into the crowns. Uh, did not particularly go out in the yard any further. So this water was splashing. The, the creek was overflowing. Uh, there was a lot of splashing, uh, the humidity, and then most likely uh, this disease was already here in this garden. The conditions are just right. Uh, we don't know if the creek overflow had spread this uh, to these plants, uh, but we um, are suspicious that it may have, again, another vector, uh, another method for this disease to spread. Okay. Um, I'm pretty convinced that we get a lot of this spread uh, from um, animals. Uh, you can see this uh, turkey. I'm not sure where this was shot. Um, I've not seen a turkey like this around maybe a domestic, but uh, we do have a pretty good high population of uh, wild turkeys in the Atlanta area, even in uh, the uh, urban areas and in the downtown areas. Uh, it's kind of surprising, but they are, uh, you see them a lot wandering through properties. Our deer population is huge. Uh, they are, um, there's deer, deer herds all through Atlanta and the, uh, out in the suburbs, metro Atlanta area, uh, because they can't be hunted uh, within these areas, the populations just uh, explode. Uh, so they wander through these gardens constantly, uh, munching and chewing. Uh, so that most likely they're part of, they're one of the vectors, um, our cute little dogs. And you can tell that cat right there is just sinister. I think he's probably a, a culprit anyway. So he just looks like he can spread boxwood light just by the eyes there. But, um, Again, uh, we we know that we've had some plantings that were infected, and as we're standing there looking at the uh, plants, uh, taking a close look at them, here comes the cat wandering through it uh, with boxwood leaf all over his uh, tail. He's wagging through there. He's uh, running uh, right along the base edge of the plants, and that's where you see these um, uh, these infections. And so we're pretty pretty confident that we're getting a lot of this, this spread from uh, animals. Again, the problem with this disease, because it's a sticky spore, this is different than most other fungi, which have a dry spore, which blow around and splash around. But because it's sticky, if you go on a property with boxwood blight or encounter boxwood blight, it is on your clothes. So then if you go into a new property, uh, you will spread that disease, those spores, into those boxwoods uh, if you walk through the boxwoods. Uh, even if you walk up to the other plants, you've introduced the spore into the property and therefore it can start spreading because of these other vectors. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. So here's the, um, the doom and gloom. Um, as far as the management strategies, um, I'll leave this up here just for a minute so you can take a look at it. I think I'm pretty sure that uh, this seminar will be uh, available to you uh, offline too. You can look up, uh, just do a general search for UGA, University of Georgia, Athens, UGA Boxwood Blight, uh, if you look up on the web, there's that long address. I'm not going to read it out, uh, but you can see it. But if you just up, look up UGA Boxwood Blight on the web, you'll see this pop up. This is Dr. Woodward's <clears throat> excellent bulletin on Boxwood Blight. There are numerous, um, <clears throat> there's numerous information available about Boxwood Blight management, et cetera. Um, so we're going to talk about this management strategy thing. Um, initially, you want to keep all your equipment sterilized with a Lysol spray. 
two and a half tablespoons of Lysol concentrate per gallon of water. The Lysol concentrate, this is not the spray can of uh, Lysol. This is the old fashioned stuff you see on the shelf, the, the old uh, brown plastic bottle. It's the concentrate, and that's what you want to use to make your uh, ready to use solution. Again, two and a half tablespoons uh, of the concentrate per gallon of water. Here's where it becomes tedious and almost impossible. Um, you need to spray your clothes between the visits to the properties. Uh, again, you're put, you know, this is the best you can do. You try to do uh, full coverage on your clothes, on your shoes. Uh, if you're pruning, you bag all the debris and you clean the tools before and after the pruning operation. Uh, pruning time during the year uh, doesn't seem to matter for us at least. Uh, if the fungus is present on any of the tools or clothes or in the uh, already in the landscape, that just hasn't exhibited uh, symptoms, uh, the infection just seems um, inevitably to happen at some point following the pruning event, and this is what we're seeing. Uh, we can see a lot of, um, uh, Rick is very familiar with the procedure on this and does a great job with the hygiene, and the knowledgeable uh, landscapers are trying their best to um, um, keep everything clean, uh, but it, you are up against a monumental uh, problem here. All right, this is probably what you're waiting for. Fungicides, most of y'all have heard that you can spray this to control it. Uh, this is what we found. In preventative fungicide sprays, they, they may work, uh, but I feel it's questionable in actual landscapes versus lab conditions. Uh, some of these properties, some of the research was in fields. Um, what we found is that um, the daconil and the thiophanate methyl combination, it seems to be the best and most effective preventive fungicide. All right, follow the label, folks. Uh, I'm not uh, telling you to what to spray or how to spray it. Just look at the label, look at the research, make sure the label covers this. Uh, right now, we have a problem with some of these fungicides aren't labeled for boxwood per se, but they are labeled for, for, for instance, volutelloblite. So if you've got this, these, pro, these fungicides in your program for volutelloblite, uh, some other leaf spots, you're you, yes, you'll possibly pick up the boxwood blight. The, the problem is that, um, again, unless you're on a um, very tight spray schedule uh, that follows the label guidelines, you're probably not going to pick it up. And what we found also that even if you are on a tight spray schedule the, and the disease is there, if you have the right weather event, most likely the disease will exhibit and it'll start eating the boxwoods. Uh, once you have the blight on the property, on the boxwoods, it is not controllable, all right? You cannot go in, prune it out, yank the plant out, and expect it to be um, not uh, spread to the other plants. Uh, the daconil and the thiophanate methyl, basically these are, the DMI fungicides alone don't seem to be as effective as combinations of this daconil type. Um, you can use uh, propiconazole, some of these other ones, uh, but that daconil thiophanate methyl has shown in a lot of the research to be the most, um, the best combination. And I keep saying follow the label so nobody gets in trouble here. Uh, follow the label as far as the recommendation. Also, uh, if you have questions, call your county agent uh, and they can help you with um, the um, spray guidelines for this. Uh, the doom and gloom here is that we just, uh, we don't know if we're really helping with our program or not. Uh, we've had breakouts within our spray programs, but normally the breakouts that we found in our spray programs have come when they've introduced a severely infected plant to the planting, or there was a pruning event. Um, and we feel like maybe our spray program is helping, but we're just not really sure because of the nature of this beast. So something that's important to realize, we get asked a question, you know, surely somebody's come up with a uh, something, a, a, an effective prevention or cure. No, they haven't. Since this was first identified years ago in Europe and, and um, up in uh, the East Coast, um, North Carolina, no one has ever come up with an effective prevention or cure for this. Uh, so uh, there's research going on, but so far we have no alternatives. So the not so rosy picture, uh, the blight's here to stay um, and it will continue to kill the boxwoods. Uh, since we have seen that most varieties are affected here, I'm going to say it. Stop planting boxwoods, please. They're all, there are alternatives. Uh, I talked to a fellow up in Maryland here recently um, that was um, wondering if I had any magic um, bullet for this stuff. I told him not really, other than don't plant them. 
his problem was he was going to uh, his new contract was going to be, I believe it was Williamsburg, which we know might have a few boxwoods up there. Uh, and uh, I just did not have an answer for him uh, other than the hygiene and just trying to keep it out of the plantings. Um, I, one of the alternatives is you can use Japanese hollies if you don't have, for instance, um, uh, black rot that attacks the hollies. Here we can use the Japanese holly, which I have been trying to get people to do for years and to replace boxwoods, uh, mainly because here in Atlanta, the boxwoods are just problematic from the get go. Uh, like I said, unless you're just planted perfectly. So again, there are all there are alternatives. So um, the first thing, um, I don't recommend removing the infected boxwoods and replanting with a less susceptible variety, which I've already mentioned. So here's an example of what happens. Uh, this is ground zero planting. Uh, you saw that original picture. It did not look too bad, but all the boxwoods eventually were infected including the Americans. That planting was completely removed. Uh, they bagged all of the boxwoods. Uh, they went in, they raked all of the debris out. They used vacuum cleaners, sucked all the debris up. They were down to bare soil. And then they used a flame sterilization of the soil, the big Bunsen burner, the big flame torch, which has in, in some research has indicated will kill the fungus in the soil. Obviously, it did not. This was uh, planting was replaced. Again, this is the ground zero planting. Uh, they put in the newly, uh, the, the uh, highly resistant variety. I believe this is um, uh, Green Valley. I could be wrong, but it was one of the more uh, resistant varieties of boxwoods. And you can see, obviously, the, the fact that these boxwoods from the bottom up, every one of them was infected from bottom up. That is spore splashing. Uh, this property also has a um, uh, a cat that lives there, uh, but the cat probably didn't do all this. But you see, every one of these has got infections from the bottom up. That is that is spore splashing. Even though the, there was a fresh bark layer down, uh, all of these new resistant boxwoods were attacked to the point where they finally continued. This disease continued right up, stopped about right here, uh, but you had dead branches up to the top, not satisfactory and uh, it just wasn't a functional planting. So again, this was a resistant boxwood that was installed and the boxwood blight jumped it and ate it. So uh, we don't suggest that. All right, you can do this. Now here's one. This is a pruning event. Um, we're gonna get to something else that's very interesting about this disease too that makes it even scarier. So this was um, um, in, I'll, I'll say downtown Atlanta. I took the, mail, the uh, address off uh, the mailbox there. Um, this was next door to one of my properties. Uh, the landscapers came in, they pruned these, they shear pruned, they were using um, uh, gas shears. Uh, I know Rick is cringing right now, probably. Uh, they use gas shears on this property. One of the interesting things is this planting looked perfectly fine. You can see here, this is what the planting looked like before they pruned. No problems. It just looked perfectly fine. Fine. Uh, they pruned it and within weeks, uh, even without a rain event, this disease took off and started eating this quite intricate scroll pattern planting. This is a lot of money. This is a dwarf English boxwood, which has so many problems to start with. It's just a terrible plant for us. Um, you can see it ate the entire planting all the way through. Uh, this is on one side of the road. This was a duplicate uh, a, uh, mirror image planting on the other side, ate the entire planting. So you could do this. Um, heck with these doggone boxwoods. Uh, we don't want to put any more boxwoods in, which would we suggest. So we put in very large hollies that are pretty, uh, and we put in artificial turf. Um, that's one way you could do it. And these white rocks are very, very resistant to boxwood blight. Uh, so both sides of this property, uh, now it's a mirror image planting, like I said. Um, again, the maintenance has dropped significantly. Uh, and this customer just has embraced the fact that they are not going to be able to plant box anymore. So this is one of the extremes that I've seen uh, how somebody um, responds to this. It's one way to do it. Personally, I like this um, example. Again, this is ground zero. Uh, we were taking pictures from the other side here, looking into the plant. There's the statue that you see. Um, and this is something that I've been suggesting from the get go, um, from the beginning when this disease moved into um, our plantings uh, that 
you can replace it with Japanese holly. All right. So the Japanese holly that were used, the corner anchor plants, these guys are steeds, pyramidals. Uh, uh, the steeds pyramidal, if you're not familiar with it, stays pyramidal. Uh, it's easily pruned. It's, if you prune it into a ball, it will still um, force itself back into a uh, central leader uh, going back into a pyramid. Uh, these are soft touch hollies. Um, soft touch came out years ago, probably 20 years ago now. Uh, it's been around for a while. It was a plant that uh, for us, we could replace our heller hollies, which are problematic in our clay soils here. The soft touch uh, seemed to have no problems. Uh, we've been recommending it for years and years and years to get away from dwarf English to start with, also to get away from the uh, heller holly. Uh, it, it's a very, very slow grower. Uh, very uniform growth, uh, easy to maintain. So uh, you can read my little discourse over here on the side. Uh, but the main problem with Japanese hollies is if you are in the business and you install them, they do grow much faster than boxwoods, especially a dwarf English boxwood. So uh, you got to have to consider um, more pruning. Uh, the planting will not is not as long lived. Uh, it is maintainable, uh, and it growth regulators probably would be something that you want to look at um, on a long term to control these plantings. Um, something like pack butrazol uh, could be done, could be used. Um, one of the companies sells a product called Trimtech, uh, very low uh, application rate that does a pretty good job of um, slowing these growths down. Uh, and you can really extend the life of this planting app. But again, to me, this is a very acceptable replacement for these uh, boxwood gardens. You can see this is a parterre English style garden, uh, slightly, you know, the, between the French and the English, different styles, uh, but it's a very uniform structured garden. Uh, this planting, again, was ground zero. They've lost now um, probably about 90% of their boxwoods, possibly not that much, but almost all the boxwoods now are infected, including the Americans. So again, this is the uh, Steed's Pyramidal Holly and the Soft Touch Holly. So uh, that so far is looking pretty good for a, a good replacement. Okay, and about ready to finish up here. I know I'm going quickly. Um, so here is the word of warning. And this is what we're finding also. This was really scary. I did a test out just at my warehouse. Um, I actually uh, had two Korean boxwoods and two dwarf English boxwoods, um, which we knew were infected with boxwood blight. Uh, the one that we had out here, we and we purposefully uh, abused them. Uh, they were outside on concrete. We watered the heck out of them. We sprayed them off. We let them get dry. They cooked in the summer. Uh, it took about three months for the um, one of the dwarf English boxwoods to completely collapse and die from boxwood blight. Uh, these boxwoods were shoved together, so you had pro close proximity. Uh, we just could not get the boxwood blight to jump to these other plants. Uh, it was quite interesting. Uh, one of the situations, one of the um, uh, points to make is these are in containers. Again, they're on the ground, so they're really they're actually well drained. They don't have a drainage issue, so the plants are actually pretty vigorous and happy. Um, after a while, um, I decided I would just force, try to force a uh, infection on this dwarf English boxwood. You can see right here that that little um, uh, brown leaf in there, that's a stem that was infected from confirmed boxwood blight. Uh, very scientifically, no Koch postulates here for any pathologists out there. Uh, if Dr. Woodward's listening, she'll laugh again. Uh, I shoved it into the plant uh, and then promptly started to abuse it. Again, overwatering, underwatering. Um, you know, we did no pruning on these. Uh, it took about 14 days uh, and we had leaf spot. Soon after that, we had lesions develop on the stem. Uh, as a plant pathologist, I was ecstatic. This is awesome that we could do this with a plant. Uh, the scary part is it does infect very quickly. So here's the key. You notice the inside of this plant. There's your lesions. Okay. You can see them there. You can see them there. You notice the leaf spot. You don't see any leaf spot. We saw very little leaf spot in this infection, but we very rapidly, we did have this uh, lesion production. So uh, the scary thing is this. Look at these leaves. Uh, that leaf right there, yeah, a little bit of off color, doesn't really look like a leaf spot. Not noticeable at all. Look at all these leaves, beautiful leaves. There were no outside symptoms. The plant was asymptomatic. 
this animal, this beast is hiding in this shrub and you cannot tell from the outside. All right, there's the plant. Uh, this is the big uh, Korean over here on the side and this is the dwarf English. That plant is fully infected and involved with boxwood blight. I hope everyone out there is shuddering at this uh, because if you're going into prune, uh, if you've got your crew on the property, your crew is probably not trained to look for this disease. You may not be trained to look for the disease. Hopefully today that uh, you can uh, get an idea of what it's supposed to look like. Uh, again, you have to go into this plant and take a close look, open it up and look and see if you see any lesions or leaf spots and then uh, be very wary. Um, if you prune this plant, if I went out there and I pruned both of these plants, it, it would have easily spread it to both plants because the, again, the target plant is infected. And this is where you'll hear the Trojan horse or typhoid Mary, the Trojan horse, the, uh, um, the soldiers hiding in the wooden horse. If you don't know that story, read up on it. Again, this is, uh, I think some of these stories have uh, disappeared, uh, but um, uh, this becomes definitely a Trojan horse. If you buy this plant at the nursery, it could be infected. Uh, if you've got it on property, it could be infected. So uh, definitely it's hiding. Uh, as they say, it's hiding in plain sight. Um, again, look closely at these boxwoods um, because you've really got to pay attention to what's going on. These are the boxwoods that were infected after the creek overflowed. All right, so your, your pruning crew goes online or your maintenance company goes online or goes on the property and they're walking through this stuff. And what they're looking at is the other side because they didn't actually go to the other side. And there's the other side of these plants. There is no, there are no symptoms there. Again, the backside, if I can back up, I'm not sure if I'll be able to do this or not. Hey, well, let me back up. There it is. All righty. See, so again, that's the backside of the same plants. Now we're going to go crazy. There's the backside of the same plants. Good solid infection. Front side, asymptomatic, perfectly good boxwood. So when you go on these properties, you've got to look at the whole whole boxwood, look inside the boxwood. Again, you're cleaning your hands in between boxwoods, your gloves that you're using, whatever you're using. You're spraying them down with Lysol because if this boxwood here has it, uh, and then you move to this boxwood, which didn't have it, you have infected that boxwood. And if you walk through these uh, and it's on your clothes, you'll ins inspect all the boxwoods on the property. Uh, so again, as far as what to do uh, with the pruning, uh, I don't have a lot of advice for you. If, if these boxwoods are infected and if you prune it, it will finish it off. So this is where the communication to your customer comes. Um, you can't point fingers at anybody. Uh, there's way too many vectors for this disease to come in and that's one of the problems. So the customer says, well, who brought it in or blames you for bringing it in? Uh, it, it's just not valid. It's, you just don't know where this thing is coming from. And so unfortunately, like I said, this was a doom and gloom slideshow. I wish I brought better news, uh, but we are looking at this as um, probably the end of um, uh, boxwood planting, uh, at least in the Atlanta area and the downtown area. Um, again, it acts differently everywhere we go and look at it, but the main problem is that it's have definitely here to stay. And uh, it is it's got to be a change, um, a sea change in how we're looking at boxwoods and how, how we can use them. So that is the end of the presentation for me. Hopefully I didn't go too fast and hopefully everybody got that and learned something today. So I will turn this back over uh, to um, Bodie and Richie. Thanks, Patrick. This was uh, excellent information, even though it was gloom and doom. Um, <laughs> Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention um, is a um, publication that we uh, developed at the University of Georgia. I'm going to try to switch to my screen here. I hope you all can see it. Uh, this is um, appropriately named, we hope, Think Outside the Boxwood. Uh, we anticipated that this might happen, unfortunately. And so we developed a, a list of uh, alternative plants and uh, it just kind of gives you an information of, you know, again, uh, the disease um, and then gives you some alternatives, uh, gives you something to take to your customers. I think it is incumbent on us to uh, really um, talk to our customers. Education is uh, absolutely critical um, to, to this. So um, I'm going to open the floor for general questions. Um, both Patrick and uh, Rick. Well, people are thinking about their questions. Uh, Patrick, I have one for you. 
Yep. Um, you may have mentioned that, um, but I just may have missed it. Uh, how far south has um, that disease been seen, detected conclusively? Um, you know what? Uh, probably what you need to do is probably check with um, Jean, what Dr. Woodward. Um, she's got a better handle on it. We've not we've not seen it um, outside going south, or we've not seen it out of, out of um, Buckhead, which is uh, you know it's a little north of of the center of downtown Atlanta. Uh, we haven't heard of it further south. Uh, it could be uh, it's, um, um, you know, I, I think, like I said, it's only a matter of time, but we have, interestingly enough, found it um, about 30 miles north as you move up uh, um, one of the interstates. And we know it um, most likely was brought in by a um, landscaper because that's the common denominator. Uh, so we know it easily spreads uh, with landscapers. So but to answer your question, yeah, I, I think you're probably going to need to check with them. Um, uh, with Dr. Woodward and see what uh, see if she's got any new um, uh, new plant samples coming in that uh, are further south. Thank you. I will do that. All right. Since we're still waiting on the audience questions, I have one for Rick. Rick, uh, could you address the pruning of uh, Chase Tree Vitex? I see quite a few new plantings, and it's a wonderful plant out there. I hope to see more of it. Um, could you just briefly talk about it? Sure. You know, uh, Chase Vitex, they bloom off of new wood. So pruning them is not really going to do any harm. Really what I recommend, especially this time of year, is go ahead and clean out the old growth, the sucker growth. Um, and believe it or not, you can actually prune those like you would a crepe myrtle and to keep it uh, in size. But if you wanted to just let it go, just keep it cleaned up and raise a canopy and you know that's pretty much it this they're indestructible that's about right it um it certainly is a, a easy to take care of plant uh what about distillium we're seeing more and more plantings of this um cultivar species that is and several of its cultivars have become mainstream i hope to see more of it well before you uh say that patrick um do yes. Doesn't the uh, distillium, if I'm not mistaken, uh, susceptible to the boxwood blight from when I hear? You know, I've heard. yeah, I've heard that too. We haven't seen any research that says it is. I know the sarcococca is. I mean, you know, a lot of folks, most folks don't know distillium because uh, it's really kind of a new, uh, the new um, plant on the block. Um, we we used to have a lot of sarcococca going in. Uh, now we have a ton of distilling going in. And so, yeah, to answer your question, I've heard that, but I've not seen any uh, definite proof that it does move to distillium. And so far, um, you know, we have been actually recommending distillium if you're moving away from that formal garden using the distilliums for uh, for the planting. Uh, they're a little harder to fit in, though. But, uh, yeah, I, I don't know that it does go there for sure. Yeah, um, but the answer to your question, Bodie, is that, it's a nice plant, however, it grows like crazy, um, about as quick as lower pedalums do. And uh, you have to keep those pretty much uh, in bay or you'll lose control over them. You can rejuvenate those if you need to. Uh, and uh, like you said, they it is a new plant. It is a nice plant for uh, an area, but just be careful because they will get out of control quick. Uh, Rick, I know that, um one of the the smaller one uh you you can correct me on it is it blue wave um i can't remember but it's one of the smaller ones that stays fairly on the ground like you said they really grow fast even though they um everybody needs to look at the final size of this these plants uh and what we found is where they've yanked out the giant lower pedalums where they had 10 of them in front of the house and about 100 square feet they put in like a blue wave distillium uh, or the smaller distillium but they once again they put in about 10 or 15 plants because they're buying the one gallon plant. So uh, everybody needs to be aware of how big this plant gets by looking at the description of the plant and knowing how to um, install it correctly. You're exactly right. They just, um, it, it's, it's, distillium is a great plant, but it's definitely a quick, fast grower. And one thing with that uh, said, whenever you see the word dwarf in front of a plant's name, all that means is that it will eventually get the same size. It just takes longer. I always tell folks that, you know, there's a, such a thing as a dwarf mink whale. That's a pretty big whale when it gets older. 
and uh, these plants are the same way. Uh, yeah, you're exactly right, Rick. Thank you, boys. Um, I I see the uh, two of the questions were answered but answered by Dr. Woodward. And in case um, the audience cannot see this, I'm going to read that. Uh, she answered my question about uh, how far south have we seen boxwood blight. Um, let's see here. We have not seen it south of Atlanta, but as far north as Rome. Also found in Birmingham and most mid-Atlantic and northeastern states. Uh, thank you very much. And in regards to the distillium, she answered that distillium is not susceptible and only in the box of blight infects only members of books associate family, which of course, Sarcococca, uh, which is sweet box and Pachysandra both are along with boxwood. Um, uh, someone made a uh, comment uh, to Rick, great presentation. Again, thank you. In addition to the Asian ambrosia beetle slide on crepe myrtle, um, you might add rose rosette disease on knockout roses. This is fairly new and landscape crews are possibly spreading it from one property to another. Uh, this is a great comment and we have a whole seminar a webinar coming up on uh, um, uh, rose rosette disease updates. So uh, absolutely stay tuned. And uh, this is definitely something that we'll be discussing in the future. Another one of those uh, gloom and doom, I'm afraid. And Jean can uh, agree or disagree with me on this. Well, thank you very much to our both speakers and uh, our audience for joining us uh, for a snowy, <laughs> uh, but, um, Great uh, start to our 2018 Green Webinar Series. Uh, please join us uh, again on March 21st when we're going to talk about invasive plants and how to control those. Um, follow what uh, uh, we send you as far as information on reporting your pesticide credits. And as always, if you have additional questions, email them to us and we will send those to our speakers. Uh, thank you all again and uh, uh, we'll meet virtually on March 21st. Thank you. Thank you, folks.